Did you know that The Phantom Menace had 9 different tie-in games? And in this video we're going to cover each of them. Episode 1 was an absolute marketing juggernaut. From toys to cups to toothbrushes to lollipops to whatever this is, every part of that movie had some kind of tie-in merchandise including video games. And even though tie-in games were nothing new back then, most movies would have one or two games released around the same time as the movie. But LucasArts kept releasing Phantom Menace tie-in games for three years, all the way up to Attack of the Clones, which had its own bunch of tie-in games. But staying with episode 1, let's start at the beginning. We're going to cover these in chronological order, and first up, released on May 18th, 1999, the day before the movie came out, we have episode 1 Racer for Nintendo 64, Windows, Mac, and Dreamcast. Boy, I love this game. Unfortunately, I was awful at it still am. Episode 1 Racer goes beyond being a tie-in game, it has everything you could want from a sci-fi racer. Fast-paced tracks, elaborate worlds, and a whole bunch of wacky characters and vehicles. There are also plenty of upgrades that you can install on your pod racer of choice, most of which are bought at Watto's Junkyard. And I always loved his ramblings in this game. They come here, they look around, they no buy, why nobody buy? <laughs> Racer also does a great job at expanding the pod race sequence from the movie and making it feel like a fully fledged intergalactic sport. Racer was also released for the Game Boy Color in December of 99. It's a pretty basic top down racing game but it does have a kick ass chiptune rendition of Jewel of the Fates. Moving on, released the same day as Racer, we have Phantom Menace for the PC and PlayStation. Now, I already did a full video covering this game a few years back, so here is the game in a nutshell. Obi-Wan cuts down TC-14, then he cuts down Qui-Gon, then the Nymordians, then Jar Jar, then Boss Naz, then everyone in Otagunga, then we go up to the surface where he cuts down the Royal Guards, and innocent civilians, then we go to Tatooine, where Qui-Gon Jinn cuts down literally everyone in Mos Espa, including Max Rebo, then we're off to Coruscant where Captain Panaka beats up some protocol droids, back to Naboo, and now it's the Queen's turn to commit mutiny on her own soldiers, and then and Obi-Wan finally takes out Darth Maul by pushing him into the shaft. Now, all the rampage aside, the Phantom Menace game has transcended the realm of tie-in games and has become a fan favourite. Yes, the game design was a bit uneven at times, but I think that's part of the charm. The game's inability to pick a single genre meant that you'd be going from action to platform to RPG all within the span of a few levels. The developers wanted you to explore the world. For example, you could use Jedi mind tricks and play nice to get through Otagunga, or, well... Also, if you grew up playing The Phantom Menace, I recommend you check out my two-part interview with the game developers. Okay, moving on, released in April of 2000 for the PlayStation, and then in October for the Dreamcast, we have Jedi Power Battles. And this game has you playing through the plot of the movie across a series of different levels. Hold on, didn't the uh, last game already do that? Yep, The Phantom Menace was such a big deal that LucasArts effectively made another version of the game a year later. Of course, the big difference here is that Jedi Power Battles is more of an action platformer that also allows for two-player co-op. And uh, this time around, LucasArts gave the developers a bit more free reign when it came to following the plot of the movie. You've got things like fist fighting battle droids, extra long lightsaber power-ups. Remember when Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon took on a giant lava worm? Oh sorry, I meant Obi-Wan and Plo Koon. Poor Qui-Gon had a hangover that morning and called in sick. Or how about that time Obi-Wan rode through the streets of Theed on a stolen droid bike destroying everything in his sight. Gameplay wise, this game is pretty hard. The platforming really requires some ninja level precision, and whatever you do, don't play the PlayStation 1 version because that game is just broken. The Dreamcast is by far the best version of that game, and even that one will have you grinding your teeth, especially the Coruscant level and the final generator stage. As I mentioned, it does 
does have co-op multiplayer, but somehow that makes the game even harder because you have to share lives now. So pick who you play this game with very carefully because this is the type of game that can destroy families and ruin friendships. Jedi Power Battles also has a bunch of unlockable characters like Darth Maul and Padme, and this mini game where you can beat up Jar Jar. <laughs> All right, moving on, released in November of 2000 for the Game Boy Color, we have Obi-Wan Adventure, another action game based on the movie's plot. Wait, this looks a lot like a Game Boy version of Jedi Power Battles. Well, I think that's exactly what the game started its life as, but they didn't have enough time to include other playable characters apart from Obi-Wan, so they just changed the name. The other evidence to this theory is that in November of 2001, the very same developer would release a version of Jedi Power Battles for the Game Boy Advance, which looks surprisingly like an updated version of Obi-Wan Adventure, this time with three playable characters. Now, both of these are pretty generic isometric Game Boy action games. You go from one level to another, jumping over obstacles and fighting droids. The most standout thing about these games is that for some reason, Jar Jar is the actual boss at the end of the Naboo Swamp level in the Game Boy Advance game. All right, let's take a break from all the lightsabers and move on to Battle for Naboo, released in December of 2004, the Nintendo 64 and PC. Now, this game was developed by Factor 5, who did the Rogue Squadron games. And that's pretty much the best way to describe Battle for Naboo. Think of Rogue Squadron, but set during episode one. You play as a brave Naboo soldier, who's uh, made of cardboard, first starting in Theed and then moving into the plains, where you defend the farmers of Naboo. They're attacking the farmhouses. Lieutenant Sykes, hurry up. Uh, Captain, I'm not sure there's anything left to defend. Oh look, civilians. Holy shit, these guys are huge. Well, you know what they say about country folks being built different. Now this game does have voiceover, but most of it just consists of people screaming in pain. Ah! The plot of this game revolves around the Naboo soldiers working to destabilize the Trade Federation by doing a bunch of missions like blowing up their comm satellite, destroying their bases, stealing their boats, and freeing civilians. Ah, what a lovely sunset. <laughs> Hey, keep it down, I'm trying to enjoy the view. Eventually, this game's campaign does dovetail into the third act of The Phantom Menace. First, you help get Panaka's forces into Theed City. Ah, there we are, and look, they're all doing the platform nine and three quarters trick. And finally, you jump into the N1 and it's time for the big battle. All right, get ready to eat a Trade Federation. Ah, crap, well, I guess I'm this guy. This level is pretty basic, you just fly around the control ship blowing up all the various radars and towers until Anakin destroys the ship from the inside. Now this game does have a bunch of extra content. You get hidden levels like this Coruscant mission and a bunch of different bonus ships. They even have developer commentary for each level, which I don't know how they managed to fit on an N64 cartridge. Battle for Naboo has kind of become the black sheep of the Factor 5 games, often overshadowed by the Rogue Squadron titles, but it's a really good game which I would recommend. All right, released in February of 2001, only two months after Battle of Naboo is Star Wars Starfighter. That's right, another game where you fly the N1 Starfighter. To be fair though, there is enough here to set these two games apart. The N64 game is set exclusively on Naboo. Starfighter starts on Naboo, but also takes place across a few other planets. There are also no land vehicles in Starfighter, Instead, it focuses on three distinct types of starfighters. You start as an N1 pilot, Reese Dallows, who joins two other playable characters, Vanna Sage, who flies the nimble Guardian Mantis, and the space pirate Nim, who flies his Havoc bomber. The trio take on the Trade Federation both in space and across a bunch of different planets. Obviously, this being a PlayStation 2 game, the environments look a lot better than they did on the N64. But these two games do have quite a bit of in common. Most missions consist of shooting down enemy fighters, protecting convoys, and blowing up some kind of enemy base. Starfighters flying and controls do feel a lot more responsive when compared to Battle of Naboo, but that's mainly because Starfighter can utilize the PlayStation 2's dual analog controls. And just like Battle of Naboo, the last few levels dovetail into the end of the Phantom Menace. The crew return to Naboo to help the Resistance take on the Trade Federation. And yes, just like the Nintendo 64 game, 
the final level of Starfighter has you join the other pilots as they attack the control ship. This level also starts with you having to destroy the various different communication towers around the control ship, however the second half of the level has you follow the game's main boss, mercenary leader, inside the control ship to take him out there. You destroy his ship and escape just as Anakin blows up the control ship. Starfighter also has a bunch of bonus features like developer photos, concept art and this weird Christmas clip. But for me this game's biggest easter egg is something I discovered by accident back when I was a kid. When I first got this game for Christmas I was absolutely terrible at it. The concept of using both analog sticks to fly was just too much for my 9 year old brain. So I would crash a lot in the first canyon area. And one time for some reason I ended up being transported into this weird stage with these giant paintings floating in the sky. After digging around I realized this was in fact artwork for the game Outlaws, which was also developed by LucasArts a few years prior. But for the longest time I thought that I had dreamt this up because I couldn't find any mention of this easter egg anywhere online. So please let me know if you've accidentally ever stumbled onto this section. Before we continue, just a quick note to say that I have started a Patreon. It's only £1 a month, so if you've enjoyed my content, please consider subscribing, as it would go a long way in helping me release videos consistently. Thank you for considering. Alright, moving on next, we have Star Wars Bombad Racer for the PlayStation 2. There's really not too much I can say about this one. It's a kart racer with characters from Episode 1. Everyone rides around in a vehicle from the movie, and everyone also has a massive head. So so massive in fact I'm surprised it didn't affect their turning circle. This game also has the least threatening version of the Imperial March I've ever heard. Alright, next up, released in December of 2001, we have Obi-Wan for the Xbox. Another action-adventure retelling of The Phantom Menace. That's right, the third one in three years. Fourth one if you count the Game Boy game. Now, this game's big gimmick is the controls. Instead of using the face buttons, you use the right analog stick to swing the lightsaber. Which takes a while to get used to. Over here! <laughs> Whoops, it's okay, it's okay, we're in a dark alley, no one saw that. And you know what, this is a true Obi-Wan game because it even has its own hello there button. Hello, 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 hello. You can run normally, but I find somersaulting everywhere to be a much faster way to get around. In order to set this game apart from its two predecessors, the developers decided to focus it exclusively on Obi-Wan and started before the events of the movie. So the first third of the game has Obi-Wan investigating some mysterious crime syndicate that has nothing to do with anything in the movie. You get a few levels on Coruscant. You'll never catch me generic thugs. Ah sh**. We then get a few more levels on this planet which looks just like Naboo but definitely isn't Naboo and whatever you do don't fall into the ketchup. And then, finally, the Jedi Council send Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon to deal with the Trade Federation. Jeez, just look at these graphics. This is supposed to be an Xbox game, but if I didn't know any better, I would have thought it was at best a Dreamcast launch title. Just look at the schnozzle on Qui-Gon. Be mindful of the living force. Now, you don't have any of the RPG exploration elements from the Phantom Menace game here. Instead, you just have to run around these identical looking corridors, chopping down droids, and pulling levers. Okay, where the this one go? Hold on. That's Newt Gunrager standing there. Qui-Gon, look, that's the guy we've been looking for. Can you, uh, chop him down? Yep. Okay, we're done. This is followed by a level on the transport, and then a bunch of levels going through Theed, and uh, unusual saber mechanics aside, this is a really generic game. Most of the levels consist of running around, chopping down enemies, turning on some kind of a switch, and backtracking. Now you see, the issue with basing the entire game around Obi-Wan is that he doesn't really do anything in this movie, especially the Tatooine section where he's just sitting on the ship browsing Pornhub. Well, the developers got a Around this by making Obi-Wan go into the Tusken camp to rescue the queen who's been kidnapped. Hold on, if Padme is the real queen and she's with Qui-Gon, then did I just get set on fire for a bloody decoy? Isn't that the whole point of a decoy? You know, you're supposed to take the fall? Uh, whatever, time to go back to Naboo. 
Oh. oh, come on. That was like a six foot drop. He's supposed to be a Jedi Knight, for God's sake. So you get a bunch more levels of Obi-Wan running around Theed and uh, taking on these uh, super battle droids from Wish. And then finally, we take on Darth Maul. So how are they going to approach the final boss in this game? Are we going to get more jumping puzzles like in Jedi Power Battles? Nope, it just cuts straight to Qui-Gon getting stabbed. Not too easy. And this final battle is really easy. And there he goes, right past the item. And there we have it, Obi-Wan for the Xbox. This game is such a bizarre oddity that I think I'm going to devote an entire video to it one day. For example, look, for some reason they're using an image of Jesus Obi-Wan from Episode 2 in the start menu of this game. Alright, let's move on to the final game of this video. Released in February of 2002, only three months before Attack of the Clones, we have Racer Revenge for the PlayStation 2. It's time for more more pod racing with all your favorite characters, including grown-up Anakin who clearly had enough of Obi-Wan's crap and decided to go back to racing. As the name implies, the new gimmick this time around is ramming the other racers until they blow up. It looks like that's it for Dumbo. To be fair, you don't have to kill the other racers to win, but the game does kind of encourage it by rewarding you with these upgrade points that you can once again use at Watto's shop. He has a higher poly count this time, but he's just as grumpy. Why nobody buys? This time around the graphics are better, the arenas have more going on, there are new worlds and new characters. Granted not all of them look great, but at least they tried. And speaking of characters, this time around you're able to unlock some fan favorites, like Darth Vader, Darth Maul, and, um, Watto? Okay, sure. This is a pretty good game, although it seems like most of the fandom has forgotten it in favor of the original. And so there we have it, every Phantom Menace tie-in game. And yes, not all of these are incredible games, but I think a few have become fan favorites. And the sheer volume of releases from LucasArts around this time was incredible. It really makes you realize how spoiled we were, especially when compared to modern Star Wars releases. Please let me know which of these games is your your favorites and why in the comments. And check out my Attack of the Clones tie-in game video if you want to see more Star Wars comparisons. As always, thanks for watching, please consider supporting me on Patreon, and a big thanks to all of my existing patrons. Also, if you've enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and hit the bell. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.